podcast that you're listening to is being presented to you with the cooperation of the SJ Network. If you're a person who needs a publicist and you want to appear on podcasts, contact Stephen Joyner at s-j-network.com. Let's get on with the show. It's a good thing that Frank Verderosa is today's guest. Good audio is very important to the Sherpa. That's very true. Let's have a listen to how quiet it is in the recording studio of the Sherpa Chalet. He's not going to be happy. He needs to do something about that water dripping. Attention, rebels of the Sherpa Lution. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. We would like to give you a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial simply by heading to www.audibletrial.com slash Sherpa. There are over 180,000 titles of audiobooks and podcasts, including this one, to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. And now, the one and only Mr. Bruce will lead you into the Sherpa chalet. As a reminder, since the Sherpa is a man of questionable taste, many of the foods sold in our cafeteria will be also... Welcome to Too Many Podcasts, the podcast about podcasts. Now, podcasting from the Sherpa Chalet on Mount Podcastia, he's your host, Jim, the podcast Sherpa. Hello there, Rebels. Welcome to Too Many Podcasts. It is the podcast about podcasts and so much more. It is I, Jim, the podcast Sherpa. Your personal podcast, Sherpa, leading you through the mountains, hills, and valleys of this place called Podcast Year, coming to you from the Sherpa Chalet. When I speak on the Wisdom app, which you can listen to absolutely free on Wednesday nights, by the way, 10 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time, I'm there at night, at night, not in the morning, I can't talk to anybody in the morning. Anyway, uh, when I'm there... Uh, and I love talking about podcasts with folks. And I get to meet some wonderful people. It's a great community. Check it out. It's absolutely free. What was I talking about? Oh, yes. So when we were talking about podcasts, I always stress the importance of having good audio. You know, no one wants to listen to you if you sound like this. It doesn't work. You know, you can't keep listeners that way unless that's the way that you talk. I don't know. Maybe it is. If you're, I'm sorry, maybe just a speech therapist or something like that. But anyway, I got to talk to my guest today who knows a thing or two about good audio. Who's our guest today, Sherpa? His name is Frank Verderosa, and and in a case of what a small world this is, he just happens to be an old college buddy of an old neighbor of mine, Mr. Jim Lasher. Cheers to Jim Lasher for making this happen. Indirectly, of course. You know, I did all the hard work. Okay, Jim, stop pat- patting yourself on the back there. But anyway, thank you. Uh, <laughs> so we got to talking, and we talked a lot of shop when we weren't recording, but I really got to know the guy while we were recording, as will you. And you will hear his story about life as a sound engineer and a mixer, an award-winning mixer, no less, and uh, all the different media that he's worked in, and also a guy with a podcast not only one podcast but two podcasts and we got to talk about both of them and we had a lot of fun uh language gets a little rough in this one so if you've got little kids maybe use the headphones or send them out of the room for a little while see i just gave you some peace and quiet you're welcome okay on to my chat with mr frank verderosa all right five four three two bag of hello there rebels (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> hey, are we allowed to curse um, on this radio show? <laughs> well, it's a good time to ask now, isn't it? <laughs> Hello there, Rebels. We are here in the audio room of the Sherpa Chalet, and my guest today is a mixer, sound designer, composer, casting director, music producer, songwriter. Uh, is, is there anything else that I'm missing? Oh, yes. Oh, friend of Jim Lasher. We have to say, yay, Jim Lasher. Yeah, also chimney sweep, landscaper, <laughs> uh, occasional uh, architect. architect. I hear an echo. You hear an echo? Oh, one way, let me see. Check, check. Check, check. Nope, no, it's gone. Okay. Might have just been the inside of my brain. That happens. <laughs> A lot. 
Anyway, his name is Frank Verderosa. If that name sounds familiar, he was the sound guy for, of course, the Gilbert Gottfried Amazing Colossal Podcast. But he's done so much more, and we're going to get to know him right here. He is speaking to me from his home in lovely New Jersey. Frank, welcome to the show, and thank you for coming on. Pleasure to be here. And the best thing about you being there and me being here is you don't have to smell New Jersey from where you are. (laughs) I guess that's always a plus, isn't it? That's a bonus. (laughs) <laughs> so this has pretty much been a lifelong passion of yours, hasn't it? Yeah. I mean, my love with audio started, you know, basically in high school. You know, my older brother is a drummer, so we always had drums. I always played guitar. Somewhere along the line, I ended up with a synthesizer. My brother got some stuff. So in high school, our garage became like a, a recording studio. And throughout high school, I used to actually record neighborhood kids in there and it just became what I do. And God help me if anything happens to my ears because I have no other discernible skills. (laughs) And and how long have you been a sound engineer for professionally? Well, my first paid job was 1990, although technically I did some paid gigs in college, but that doesn't really count. So we could say 89, but it's been like 32 years. And, and I know that you also, uh, you worked really with any different forms of media between radio and television and movies and and music and podcasts. Yeah, but, you know, using the same skill sets for all of those things. So uh, before we hopped on, I'm prepping casting for some TV spots that I have to get voice actors for in two different languages. Um, I, this week, I produced a commercial for Ikea. Um you know, do a lot of their radio ads. I've been doing them since 2016. So any any IKEA radio ads you hear, that happened here. Um, and uh, TV spots, but then I record a lot for animation. So a lot of times actors would come to our studio for Disney, Nickelodeon, Cartoon Network, Adult Swim, you name it. Um, and that carries over from my previous job uh, where I did a lot for Archer and some some of the big Disney films and then, you know, it's the same skill set that gets applied to television where we have to loop actors after the fact or movies. So a little bit of everything, but it's all basically a uh, big fat bald guy in a studio hitting the shiny red button and twirling knobs. So for all the different genres. <laughs> you know, uh, I always have a theory, like uh, guys who like who have your job and you like a lot of voiceover actors. I always kind of felt that you probably hear things a little differently than most people. Like what? You're more sensitive. <laughs> yeah, you got that. Most people fall for it. Um, <laughs> I do. In fact, I am I am in painfully noise sensitive. If I'm in a restaurant, and my wife hates this on the, the few times we go out post-COVID these days, if it's noisy, I really have a hard time focusing on what I'm hearing in front of me. If it's a loud environment, I, I struggle. I just... I'm so sound sensitive that I can tell you what everybody around me is talking about. I can tell you how many forks just fell, you know, while we were having a conversation, like all of it. And I struggle to to hear who's right in front of me. So yeah, I'm super (laughs) noise sensitive. And I think part of that comes from being in a soundproof room all day, every day, and then go out into New York City and it's just like noise pollution. It's hard for me. <laughs> it, it, that's going to be almost a little bit of like a, a shock to your ears, I guess, especially since you're so confined to, oh, totally. like I said, in the city where, you know, it's never yeah. really that quiet unless it's like two o'clock in the morning and you're yeah. alone on the street or something. But then along came noise canceling headphones and my commute got so much better. <laughs> Even on my commute in New Jersey transit, I'm sure they have it on Long Island Railroad too, but I get in the quiet car, first car, the train, quiet car. Nobody's talking. Nobody's on their phone. It's just time to chill. So I, I <laughs> hate noise. Especially, you know, doing like as, as a sound designer, there's probably so much that you've got to pay attention to that probably most people aren't even thinking about to get that that crystal clear recording. That, but also, yeah, and keenly aware of everything. Because, for example, if you were to turn on your TV now, And let's say you put on Law & Order or maybe a commercial and it's somebody walking through the city talking, you have to know that everything you hear is put in after the fact most of the time. Um, So they will record the actors, but let's say it's a restaurant scene. There are Mm -hmm. companies, and I have friends that, that run one of these companies, that do what they call loop group work. So they literally will look at a big screen. Well, it's changed now since COVID. Now they're all looking at computer displays at home. But- um, 
they would all say, okay, uh, I'm going to be that guy talking to that woman. You be that woman and you're going to be this guy. And they, they will sort of make background noise again and again and again and pick different characters. Or if it's a, a restaurant and they're walking in, you see a mater d walk by really quick. They didn't record anything on the day, but they'll have somebody go right this way, sir, you know, passing by the mic. All those little sounds, every dish, every fork, every sip of a cup, every bird tweeting outside, every siren, every car honk, it's all placed in by somebody like me to to ironically make it more real, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that is a strange kind of irony. And it's so weird. Like I've done so many projects where I spend a whole bunch of time removing all the background noise, cleaning up the dialogue, editing it, and then putting a whole new layer or layers of ambience you know, there's a jet flying by. Well, we have to hear that jet. There's a, a police car flash. Just like, well, we have to hear that. You know, everything makes a sound and it's our job to make sure it's all accounted for. So so the sounds that we're hearing when we're watching TV and movies are are controlled by the yeah. people who are making them. Yeah, by design. <laughs> that was really cool. Now, I know you work with uh, some music producers as well and do, you know, working the boards for a lot of different artists. Could you tell the story about uh, the, the Notorious Big? Uh, well, he's the reason I shifted and went to what we call audio post-production. So at the time I was at a studio called Soundtrack New York, which is a great facility. It's where I really got my big start. Like I'd worked at places before that, but Soundtrack was really like entering the big league and it was a, a good career boost. Um, but I was doing album work. I would assist albums. I got to engineer some cool stuff. In the 90s, when that was happening, rap was prevalent, right? Everywhere. Every room at Soundtrack at night was rap, rap, rap. During the day, they had ad agencies coming in doing commercial work, which was cool. A different world, though. I wasn't a part of that world. But mm -hmm. I love the technology. So I had been sort of learning that stuff. And Soundtrack offered me a position doing post-production, which is commercials, film, all the things we just talked about. But I was a music guy. I was really hell bent on seeing that through. And I was working with big artists like Puffy back in the day, you know, Sean Cohen. I never called him Puffy. I refused that, you know, if people would say, you're working with Puffy, I'm like, no, I'm working with Sean. I'm not, uh, I'm not calling anybody <laughs> Puffy. And I think he was okay with that. Um, and I got to work with Run DMC and a lot of cool bands. Soundtrack just had everybody. It was just a bustling world at night there. So then one night I got put on a session cutting vocals for a, a rapper named Notorious B.I.G. Or at the time, Biggie Smalls. He wasn't Notorious yet. And, you know, when you have your multi-track master, your two-inch tape, every track has its sound. It's got a drum loop, a bass line, a sound, like whatever. It's, it's all on tracks. And we got to this one part. Now, he's in the booth. It's pitch black. And he's doing his thing. But this one sound effect of a gun going kept coming up like the cocking of a gun. I'm like, where the flick? It's so loud. Where is it? It's not labeled on the track sheet. It's not on the board. I'm really getting annoyed. He comes out after a few takes. He was playing with his actual gun in the booth for the sound effect. Now to paint the picture of what's going on at two o'clock in the morning on a rap session, it's just weed everywhere. Everyone ordered Chinese food four hours ago. So you have half-eaten containers of Chinese food all around the room. It's a party for them, like the, their whole crew, which is great. But for me, it's work and I'm tired. It's two in the morning. So the next day after I saw the gun play in the studio in a pitch black booth, I went to the owner and said, you know what? I'm going to take you up on that offer of doing this other life where it, you know, the difference between the rap world was for a couple of years after college, I never saw daylight. I would commute in late at night. I would come home at sunrise, wait for the next booking. In the commercial world, in the post-production world, you're in at like 9 a.m.-ish. You know, there's bagels and coffee. The clients are ordering sushi. There's cappuccinos to be had. You're done 6, 6.30 and you're home. Much better lifestyle. Generally, weekends off, no holidays, no, no nonsense. So that was kind of a no-brainer for me. It's interesting to go from one you know, life in the same building to another one. I have to say though, for all my complaining back then, I miss it a lot. I love what I do now and I love the people I get to do it with, but mm -hmm. any chance I get to sink my teeth into a musical related thing, I'm happy because it's what I really, really enjoy a lot. Were there any artists that you work with? I know you said you work with a lot of big names. Was there any in particular that you, when you were working with them that you were just kind of a little starstruck? I never get starstruck. 
uh, it's weird. The stuff that I would get starstruck over, uh, it's a name you probably don't know. When I was in college, I was really into jazz and jazz fusion and contemporary jazz. And there was a band my brother, my older brother turned me on to called Special Effects. And the guitar player for that band was a guy named Kelly Minucci. Great, great guitar player, super sweet guy. I had the pleasure of working with him, you know, after college. So one morning I was at an old studio I worked for called Home Base, long gone. And I walked into the room. I didn't know what we were doing that day, but I saw all these guitar cases that said special effects. And it turned out that Kelly was producing or co-producing this artist, this sort of great jazz vocalist uh, on this project. And I got to actually meet somebody I'd spent so many years admiring and listening to. And he was just super nice. I remember he had a gig in Huntington with special effects and invited me and one of the other assistants up to come backstage and hang out with them. Just super great. Fast forward to 2022 for my birthday, uh, my brother and I and our families went to go see Kelly uh, and special effects play at a club up in, up in uh, oh gosh, kind of like the Nyack area. Uh, and it was super cool to kind of see him, but I don't think he, I didn't go up to him and say hi. I wish I had, but I doubt he'd remember 30 years ago. Um, I was sort of awestruck by that. But in the time that passed since, I've worked with everybody celebrities, musicians, like they, you know, a lot of really big names. And I, my job is to be a professional. I don't generally get dumbstruck when I see them. More recently, I got dumbstruck when I got in an elevator at Soundtrack where I was sort of freelancing for a little while back in late 2018. And the editor for um, Breaking Bad, the video, the editor who kind of ran a podcast for the show was in the elevator. And I was like, holy shit, holy shit. And my friend was like, what's up? I'm like, do, do you know who that is? Like, no, I'm like, that's the editor. She had her headphones in and we're like whispering behind. And finally it's like, you know, she turns around and she's like, can I help you guys? I'm like, I just have to say I'm a huge fan. <laughs> and I think it kind of freaked her out because, you know, it, she was, I was doing the like, aw shucks that you, you would do for a celebrity, but to the video editor, because I was such a fan of the work. She's fucking phenomenal. Anyway, so- that's that I, I get starstruck by weird stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> so I was curious. I mean, having worked with a lot of different artists uh, in, in the music area, uh, what kind of music do you usually listen to when you're not working? I am a diehard uh, Genesis progressive rock fan. So I am okay. all about Peter Gabriel, Genesis, Yes, Rush. Marillion, which no one's heard of except for a small circle of friends. Uh, I just actually got an autographed Steve Hackett Blu-ray from his most recent tour that I didn't go to because of COVID, but they filmed it and he was selling autographed copies. So, And he was the guitarist from the original Genesis back mm -hmm. in the day. Um, so yeah, that's the stuff that makes me happy. But I have a, a really wide palette for music, you know, classical I appreciate some rap. I appreciate some new stuff that's out there. I just hate country. That's that's specifically mentioned for my friend Rob, who might be listening. Or, or we'll let him know if he's not. Yes. <laughs> I just have a, a very low tolerance for country. But even that'll change. I think the older I get, the more I just want to hear mellow stuff, you know? You know, uh, when I started listening to country, probably around like the 90s, I felt that a lot of the 90s country was very similar to like a lot of the 70s pop. So I think Definitely. it was easier for me to adjust to it. Wasn't Definitely. I think, and, and these days it's kind of hard to tell. Like it's such a crossover that it's kind of, you know, country now just sounds like soft rock from the 80s or 90s. It's like it's, it's all blurred, you know, but I like <laughs> it. I like when things sort of get homogenized a little bit. And it's funny because some of the rap stuff I would work on in the 90s, I would play keyboard parts on and I'd be bringing these like progressive rock chord progressions and like little overlay melodies on top of these rap beats. And the rappers would be like, yo, that shit's dope. I'm like, I'm fucking turning them into Phil Collins and they don't even realize it. <laughs> but it was fun. You know, sometimes that stuff pops up on my iTunes shuffle because I've loaded all my old things in there and I'll listen to it and just sort of laugh at like you know, how silly that was. <laughs> I guess some people have to keep that in mind the next time they're, they're listening to some uh, serious beats and uh, you, you've got probably got some Marillion in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or just some kind of like out of nowhere, like heart part coming in or something weird. <laughs> <laughs> so you were saying that you have a, a podcast and I haven't had to check out Everyday Odysseys. Can Everyday you talk Odysseys, a little bit yeah. about that? Yeah, well, you know, I it's funny. 
Bef- you know, of course, I worked on Gilbert Show for five years. Rest in peace. Mm-hmm. Um, but as I was departing that show, I began a new series called Unsung, The People You Don't Know You Know. And that is whereas Gilbert's show is all about celebrities, this one was like all the people I work with that are behind the scenes, video editors, voice actors, cartoon people. Um, mm-hmm. And I started banking some episodes for that. And then COVID hit. And I just decided I I only wanted to do in-person interviews. In fact, right before lockdown, I was supposed to go to Jackie Martling's house on Long Island to mm-hmm. record him and just talk about not his career so much as like comedy in general, plus what he's done. And then it was like, maybe we better not lock. And then it was just COVID hit. So during COVID, I started consulting with voice actors that really needed to learn how to work remotely because a lot of people weren't prepared for that. And a lot of times my last appointment would end at 1130 at night and I became a bartender. People would just start opening up about whatever. And we would just chit chat. And I just thought this would be a fun podcast, just sort of fly on the wall, people talking about their stuff. Uh, that led to a lot of us hanging out on an app called Clubhouse, which is sort of like a 24 seven, you just create a room, you're the host, whatever the topic. And a lot of voice actors would get in there, but invariably it would suddenly be two, three in the morning and people are pouring their hearts out. I'm like, I got to turn this into something. So I created this thing called Everyday Odysseys. And, um, it's sort of born out of those conversations. Episodes one and two of the series is actually my buddy Rob that we mentioned earlier, who lives out by you. He was a firefighter on Long Island, but worked right next to the World Trade Center. And on 9-11, you know, he dropped his bags off at work and went down to help. It's a very compelling story. And, you know, I've known him forever and I've heard bits and pieces. Uh, you know, of course I know and and I ended up scooping him up off the shore of New Jersey and bring him to my apartment at the time because nobody had heard from him and he managed to get cell service for like a minute and put out the call. And I was like, dude, just stay where you are. I will find you. But anyway, it's a really intense story and it ended up being a two part uh, episode. One is about nine 11 and what his, you know, moment to moment was like that day complete with very rich sound design. It's um, I don't know if you're familiar with binaural audio, but kind of puts you there. So if you're wearing headphones, you're going to feel like you were in New York City on 9-11 at some moments. Um, And then part two is about the emotional and physical toll in the years that followed 20 years later. So so that's episodes one and two. By episode three, I got to something more lighthearted. It's a a breast cancer survivor, double mastectomy. Uh, You know, that's just, that's that's the lighter side of the show. Uh, But I've got upcoming episodes about um, somebody who wanted to kill themselves and parlay that into a business. I've got, um, you know, a guy who took a severe anxiety issue and turned it into a business for himself. Uh, A woman whose father was shot down in Vietnam and she went back there to find where he went down and became friends with the family that found her dad's remains back in the day. All these just very interesting, interesting stories from everyday people. Uh, and how it affects their lives, you know, and it's just, it, it's, it's very rewarding to hear it. It's, it's a lot of work to put it together because it's like documentaries about people you've never heard of basically, but mm-hmm. I find it fascinating. I don't know that I'll make a dime with it. That's not why I'm doing it. Uh, it's a labor of love and I do it when I can. So that's everyday odysseys. I like that. Believe it or not, those are well suited to podcasts because I think a lot of people like to hear that story of resilience of you know people who are down and then and they make they make it back up. It yeah. probably does something for their psyche as well. Yeah, I mean, there's this one. The next episode I'm rolling out that I'm nearly completed is a, a woman named Sylvia Longmire who was uh, in the military and then diagnosed with MS and then took her military career got her you know she she was done with the military full benefits to deal with her ms then she became sort of a consultant and an expert on border security and all these other things and then she started writing books and and she's a travel agent for people in wheelchairs and she continues to she just took what would be a debilitating illness for some and parlayed it into an empire for herself uh, so from her wheelchair, she, she has this little empire she's made. It's, it's just wonderful. It's uplifting. And they're, they're fun stories to hear. 
So, I mean, you did mention Gilbert. They came to the studio where you were working. Is that yeah, how you got Gilbert, to meet them? Gilbert was coming in fairly often for like Nickelodeon and for Disney. And, you know, he's not somebody you really just get to know. Um, he was very quiet. If you've ever met him, he's just a really quiet, really reserved guy. Yeah. I remember one day when I was probably at my heaviest as a human being, he came into our, he came into my studio and he said, he looked around at the time the studio had pulled the snacks out. There was, they were cutting back clear sign that something was wrong. I should have known, but they were taking the snacks. We used to keep jars of candy and chips and all this stuff in the room. And he came over and said, um, where are all the snacks? And I just leaned back in my chair and said, Gilbert, look at me. Do I look like I need snacks in the room? And he <laughs> fell over laughing. And anyone that knows him knows that laugh, right? And it's the be- if you can make him laugh, that was heaven. And that was the first time for me. But even then, you know, he would come in to record quietly. But then one day he came in with his wife, Dara, who's awesome. And, you know, we chatted a little bit and she was there to kind of get him situated or whatever. And shortly after that, a friend of mine hit me to the podcast and I started listening to those early episodes, which were very engaging, but terribly produced. The audio. Yeah, they did it in his, in his yeah, house. Yeah, they were sitting yeah. around a microphone at a kitchen table, very echoey, yeah. not good at all. So I was in the quiet car, which we talked about earlier on the train, and I thought I had my headphones in and they weren't. And I started Gilbert's podcast. So now you have to imagine a dead quiet car and then it's every episode starts with hi this is gilbert got like shouting and i was like sorry 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 plug my headphones in quick as i could and then i made a facebook post about it it's like that awkward moment when you know <laughs> and a client of mine commented like oh i actually used to date the co-host of that show and i said oh well tell him i love the show but i hate the sound quality and let me know if there's anything i can do and by the time i got to the studio for work the phone was already ringing. It was Gilbert's wife wanting to work something out. So very quickly, we made a deal with them where they would come in at night uh, to record. But it kind of grew from there because I realized he was saying my name in every episode, but the raw audio files were being sent to a guy in California who wasn't really mixing them. He was just sort of packaging it up and shipping it out, and it wasn't sounding right. And so then I started really cleaning it up. And blah, blah, blah. And then long story short, they switched podcast networks. I became the audio engineer slash producer. Uh, I took the show and started putting in like teasers for the mini episodes and, you know, celebrity shout outs for the next episode coming. And I kind of structured it like I did a lot of promos for networks as part of my job. Um, So I started incorporating a lot into the show. So it was a little bit more polished. So it just became this all consuming thing for five years. Yeah, and you were a little more featured in in a lot of the other mini episodes. The as mini well. episodes is where we all got yeah. to fuck around. Yeah, so that was fun. <laughs> I like being a part uh, of that. So, so being a fan of the show, I, I have to ask you. I guess there was a an inside joke with you guys with episodes that were deleted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Gilbert liked giving me shit. I so there was a they were doing a live uh, thing. I don't know if, if you know Joe McGinty. He's a great musician. And he owns a place called Sid Gold's Request Room in the 20s. It's a live piano bar, a karaoke place. Really great place to hang. Uh, and a lot of celebs kind of pop in there too. So he's got a great thing going. So they decided to do a few. We used to do these mini episodes centered around uh, one hit wonders and stuff like that. So they came up with the idea to do this live karaoke thing with Joe McGinty. And the first time they were doing it, it was my daughter's back to school night or parent teacher conference night. And I couldn't go. I said, I'm sorry. I just, you know, got a family first. And um, so their old sound guy that used to record sometimes when they would go to the Friars Club, he came in and covered it. And I'll never forget. It was like five o'clock in the morning. He emailed super apologetic that something had happened. Like the battery died as he hit stop. And it was whatever happened somehow in all that, the whole night was lost. The episodes just never mm-hmm. Never got recorded, or they got recorded, but the system glitched, and that can that can happen to anyone. So it wasn't really anybody's fault. Just the the <laughs> machine glitched. There was no backup. 
it happens. It sucks. So Gilbert, for every other episode, since we're like, and Werner Rosso lost those episodes. And Frank, <laughs> the co-host, would always correct him. He's like, I don't care. He's guilty. You know, it just became a became a whole thing. Uh, part of me wants to have found those discs and buried them with Gilbert in his you know, when the threat when the dirt was being thrown on the coffin, that was my chance to just throw in the discs. Like no one will ever hear them. Um, Put them in a little bouquet of flowers or yeah, something. Like. Just drop them in. But yeah, so that was that. And the irony being the next time they did Sid Gold's, I was available. So a year or so, maybe two years later, I can't remember. But I had by then a whole mobile setup. And I went in the night before and tested everything. And then on the night, I got in there and the power cable for my recording unit was flaking out. And I was like, I can't believe this. I'm about to do this, but I have to run out and get batteries to run this thing. And I went out to like the nearest store. I'm like sweating bullets running. It was a hot muggy night. Got a bunch of batteries, shoved them in there. And the whole night, all I kept thinking is, please don't let him die. Please don't let him die. <laughs> it was fine. The episodes are great. Really great if you can find those old episodes. <laughs> such, such good memories. So much fun. Well, we're talking about podcasts. What podcasts do you like to check out? Uh, uh, you know, still occasionally Gilbert's, um, although there haven't been any new episodes recently. I don't know what the story is there. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to let that sink in. He died. So there won't be any new episodes. Yeah. Well, no, <laughs> I, I know, weren't they supposed to do like a, a tribute episode at the end? I remember we they did. I went to that a couple of weeks ago at City Winery and it was fucking amazing. They had Frank Santo Padre came out with Gino Salamone, who's like one of Gilbert's best friends, right? Mm -hmm. So they came out, they did their bits, and then they brought out Mario Cantone, Rupert Holmes, Richard Kind, Craig Bierko, Jason Alexander, the lead singer for The Love and Spoonful, who wrote the Welcome Back Cotter theme. John Sebastian? Yes, he came out and sang. It was just like a who's who, and it was just so wonderful. I mean, you'll hear it all. I, I know it was all mm -hmm. captured for as an episode, but oh my God, was that joy definitely looking forward to that. are there any other ones that you like uh, checking out uh i i was addicted to cereal and i love that they just had a conclusion i haven't listened to the episode yet but are you familiar with cereal uh yes yes yeah, you know a podcast is big when like my niece from london would be texting me saying there's a new episode and i would like jump on it and ironically the co-producer of that show lives in my town actually there's a lot of really heavy podcast people in my town the there's a company called Gen Z Media that is crushing it, and they're based here. They have several award-winning podcasts that were all picked up by Netflix, Disney, and Hulu uh, as TV shows. So that's like next-level podcasting. Um, but I like Serial. I love Marin. I love Gilbert. I don't commute anymore, so I don't really have a lot of time to sit and listen to stuff. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, if, if I pause my video, you'll see my uh, – this is my home studio – so that's where okay. I'm sitting now. So I'm mixing surround sound spots. I'm recording actors remotely. I I commute one, maybe two days a week, sometimes none, um, but still getting the job done. So this podcast listening is kind of tapered off, you know? Mm -hmm. There's so many good ones. I just, I don't have time. Frank, we have a portion of the show and it is called Shameless Self-Promotion. Shameless self-promotion. Shameless self-promotion. And this Hasn't is where this you whole everybody thing been shameless self-promotion? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the real heavy-duty stuff now. Oh, God. So I you can let everybody know how they can get in touch with you. I know you've got a lot of stuff going on and making yourself available to the general public for we you know with your audio services. Yeah, I mean so I work full time for Digital Arts in New York City. That is my employer Monday through Friday more or less 10 to 6, sometimes later, sometimes earlier. Uh, I'm on the clock for them. So I'm dealing with ad agencies, I'm dealing with animation companies, film studios. That's my gig. At night, and it really started because of the pandemic when all these actors suddenly are like we can't go anywhere, but we still need to work. Um, and one of the things I got known for during the pandemic is literally celebrities would pull up in my driveway and I would bring them out a microphone and headphones and record with the clients on Zoom. And we were able to just stay distant. They would sit in their car and do commercials. <laughs> Happened a lot. Um, that kind of became this consulting business that I still do pretty much every night. Um, 
And that led to demo reel production and audiobook editing for other people. So I, I keep my nights busy. I don't watch a whole lot of TV anymore. Uh, but I really, I love all the things. I love all the audio work. And I love young actors that have a good setup and they'll book me for a 15 minute consult and find out subtle changes that will make a huge improvement in their sound. Uh, and it's just so worth it. And I, you know, I do all that stuff. It's super cheap, super affordable for them. And I just, it makes me happy. So, so, and, and you have a website. Yeah. It's just frankverderosa.com. Uh, if you're a voice actor and listening to this, you can click on the chat tab and get at me there. There's a help tab. If you're stuck and you need some quick help, you can book an appointment there. But really, it's also a calling card. You can click on my uh, more popular TV mixes and radio production and look at my IMDb credits for movies and stuff like that. So, yeah, that's my website. Okay, there you go. And my podcast, which I previously plugged. Yes, Everyday Odysseys, folks. You got to check this out. And his name is Frank Verderosa. Frank, thank you so much for coming by. It was really great to meet you. Yes, it's been fun. Okay, you got the stop button there. (laughs) Nope, I'm just going to leave it going. Don't want to (laughs) leave. I can just edit out all the rest of this. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Let's get back to the Sherpa. Sorry about that. No. Okay, I know that you guys are probably blaming me when you get that song stuck in your head, but you know what it means. It means it's time for Sherpa Samples, and this is when I sample episodes of some of the podcasts that are out there and fill you in on what they're about, so you don't have to. Well, you could if you want to, I don't know. And if if there's a podcast that you enjoy and you'd like me to sample it, I will do that for you. You just have to contact me through social media or email. Throw a name at me. If it's something I haven't listened to, I will check it out. And it's the big part. The big part, you will get your name mentioned on the show. I promise. Very cool. A couple of people have done it. You can do that as well. So here are some of the ones that I checked out this time around. I've been working off of one podcast chart. There's so many different podcast charts. There's not really one uniform chart as far as I know. So uh, the podcasts that I listen to for this section are mostly from Apple Podcasts and from Spotify. And they're both two very good podcast platforms. Uh, Lots of people listen. Lots of people. I even have an exclusive Spotify show on there that you can't hear on this one if you're listening on Spotify Premium. That's the one called Too Many 80 Songs with Mr. Bruce. But I digress. Let's talk about Sherpa Samples. So I checked out All There Is, and that is with CNN anchor Anderson Cooper. And Anderson's mom was the late Gloria Vanderbilt. And she was an heiress. And the show has to do with him, I guess, coming to terms with her death and some of the things that she left behind. It tugs at the heartstrings a little bit, I think, especially maybe for folks who have lost a parent. But, you know, if you want some closure, uh, I I think he helps really with what he's going through, make it very relatable, even though I'm sure not all of our mothers or fathers were heirs or heiresses. But uh, it's a really powerful show, and uh, I I thought it was really interesting. Also, uh, there was fantasy football. I don't know anything about fantasy football. Uh, this had three guys on it, and you know, they talked about fantasy football. If you're into fantasy football, there's another popular show for you to check out, Fantasy Football. That's all I can say, because if I don't want to say things wrong about that. And there was Wolves Among Us. I think this is, will be a uh, series that will be about several different people. The episode that I checked out was about a guy named Larry Laven, who was a dentist who was uh, considered one of the biggest drug dealers in the United States. And he was basically just trying to raise money to go through dental school. <laughs> but uh, he, he had an interesting story. So uh, that's what Wolves Among Us this season is about. And there is Raised by Ricky, and the Ricky in question would be Ricky Lake, and she's on with her co-host, and they rewatch some of her old shows. Uh, she did a talk show back in, I guess, the 90s, early 2000s, I don't remember. 
And the episode that they talked about was when one woman pulled the wig off of another woman's head right <laughs> during the show. And that was like the big event of that show. And also, uh, The Letter, it's a true story of uh, a couple that went hiking and were shot by uh, a stranger. And what happens afterward? And uh, I don't want to get too much into it. It's a really unusual premise. I heard the first chapter, and you can kind of tell what happens down the line, but uh, definitely not your typical true crime story. And there were a few other True crime stories that I got to listen to. One was Cold Cases, and they talked about the Texas Killing Fields, which is uh, where a lot of murders ended up taking place, and uh, the suspects who arose during that case. And also there's another show called Buried Bones, which just kind of started out not too long ago. Uh, Kate Dawson is a journalist, and Paul Holes is a retired investigator. And they take modern-day techniques of investigation and apply them to old cases to see who might have done these cases. Definitely an interesting premise for a true crime podcast. Also listen to the Candace Owens show. Uh, at the time of this recording, I think she was uh, dating Kanye West. Uh, I'm not going to say too much about that. <laughs> and I, a lot of it is uh, pop culture with a political spin. Uh, she's from the... Morning Wire crowd, I guess. I think they produce the podcast as well. So there is a lot of politics thrown in there. So if you don't like politics with your comedy, don't listen. Otherwise, check her out. And there is another one called Killed, which has to do with stories that may not have made a big splash in the media field, but then got a second chance. And that was one of the ones that I listened to. Uh, the episode was about... Uh, an author's story, which was going to be on This American Life, about the streets in Chinatown. And there's a fascinating story behind that. It was a, it was a really nice podcast. Very Again, very unique. I liked it. Real Ones is with John Bernthal, and he speaks with people who have been in all sorts of different situations. The episode that I listened to, he spoke to two very well-known uh, police officers from the LAPD, and they talked about... Uh, the L.A. riots in the 1990s and a lot of the crazy things that were going down in L.A. in that era that they were a part of. And finally, finally, yes, finally, okay. <laughs> and finally, uh, there's one with uh, Adam Grant. His podcast is called Rethinking, re colon thinking. It's important. It's got a colon in it, or not a semicolon, but a colon. And he has a lot of different uh, interviews with well-known people, and how they may have affected the world. And this episode, he interviews Jane Goodall, the lady who worked with all the primates and everything like that, and did all this wonderful research. And of course, any interview with her is going to be fascinating. So another one to check out. So you got a really good mix in this bunch, and you can keep an eye on your podcast charts on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever it is that you are listening to your podcasts. And uh, hopefully the one that you're listening to has a certain show called Too Many Podcasts because somebody's bound to recommend that sooner or later. I don't know. But in the meantime, I think we'll just play the outro. Cue the music! A very special thanks to all of you for taking a little time and listening to my conversation with Mr. Frank Ruderosa, and a very special thanks to Frank. You know, when we sat down to our interview, I hadn't listened to his podcast yet, but I checked it out, and it is really great stuff. Uh, if you definitely want to check them out, I would strongly advise it. It's a Sherpa favorite. We can say that. And, you know... Uh, this show is a favorite of yours, maybe you can give me a nice review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Let people know about that Sherpolution. And why is Sherpolution such an important word? Okay, class. Those of you who know, you can repeat it. It's the name of my website, Sherpolution.com. S-H-E-R-P-A-L-U-T-I-O-N.com. And it's also where you can follow me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I'm always there. I keep you informed of what's going on with the shows, you know, and if you would ever like to reach out and offer a comment about the show, maybe if you like it, maybe you don't like it, you can let me know on social media, or you can even 
email me. Yes, I will give you my personal podcast email address. It is Jim the Podcast Sherpa at gmail.com. All little letters because I'm a little person. I don't know. <laughs> all right, Mr. Bruce, I think we're all done here. And we will be looking forward to seeing you guys the next time. Thanks again for listening. And until then, viva la Sherpolution. Thanks for listening to Too Many Podcasts. Please disperse. You can go home now. I said you can go home now. Viva la Chapalition. Viva la Chapalition. <coughs> oh. Yeah, I'll come back now, you hear?